Hey everyone, Brian Zane here. By now, a lot of you have probably seen the Vince Russo Will Change Your Life sketch, in which Jim Cornette himself makes a cameo appearance at the very end of the video. Well, not only did I travel to Louisville for that, I also had a one-on-one -on -one interview with the Louisville Slugger himself. I've been deliberating uh, for a while now as to whether or not to put this interview up online because honestly, it doesn't, it's not quite as good as I hoped it to be, and not from a content standpoint, but from a visual standpoint. Partway through the interview, one of our camera angles just stops recording. I don't have that footage halfway through. Uh, and not only that, but the other angle we do have, it cuts off after the, we, we missed the last couple of minutes of that interview. So it's not a complete interview really. So I was wondering, should I put it up there because it doesn't look as good as I want it to be. At the same time though, I went all the way to Louisville for this, and so I'm gonna make the use of this footage the best that I can. So for your viewing pleasure, here it is, the one-on-one -on -one interview between myself, Brian Zane, and Jim Cornette. I hope you enjoy. Hello everyone, I'm Brian Zane, and welcome to a very special edition of Wrestling With Regret. Some say this man is uh, my illegitimate father, and I am his illegitimate son, but I'm here to say for the record that is not the case, but this man is a great influence to me as a manager, and a uh, hell of a guy, Jim Cornette. Brian, thank you very much for having me on Wrestling With Regret, and there's a lot of illegitimacy being thrown around, but I, you're, you're actually, I'm your legitimate father, you're just my illegitimate son. Oh, okay, well then I guess that has to explain it to you to my family. Legitimately. To my family back in Portland, I'm very sorry you had to learn this. I'm way. sorry you have a family back in Portland, <laughs> I feel so much sympathy for them. Yeah, it's a fine city though. By um, the way, that was a free bowl of soup with your tracksuit also, it's very <laughs> nice. Exactly. Very nice. It looks good on you. Thank you. Custom made, but you know, I just want to say thank you, Jim, very much for being willing to cameo in my Vince Russo <laughs> blame someone else sketch. Uh, I, I'm totally overwhelmed and blown away you were willing to do that. Uh, especially the fact that I basically I didn't have much to sell to you because I told you, hey, I got a Vince Russo well, no, sketch. Well, no, no, you, you, you sold it like a master. You sold it like an auctioneer because you said, I can't pay you. I have no money. And it'll require a lot of your time and, and a lot of your energy, but you get to punch somebody who is purported to be Vince Russo. I said, I'm sold. Yeah, I'm I, sold right. I didn't have a script. All I knew was, I'm going to be Vince Russo. The punchline is Jim Cornette's going to punch me. That's all it took. <laughs> I was going to figure out the middle point later on, and I did, and so thank you again for appearing in that. But you know, in, in all seriousness, I enjoyed the uh, Cornette Gets It Wrong parody that you did because it's, it, it, was, it was good on so many levels because some people didn't get it. Right. And they legitimately thought that you were lampooning me, or well, you were lampooning me, but they thought you were blistering me, right? Yeah. And for the smarter, cooler people, such are the fans that, like me, they understood that it was a parody that you were going uh, so far in the other direction that you were actually putting me over because of all the people who say, oh, Cornette's never right. He's, he never gets it right. Exactly. It was a Rorschach test because when I was watching the reactions online, people, yeah, there was one of two responses. There was either, oh, this guy's hating on Cornette or this guy's hating on us, the fans. What the hell? So, it's, yeah, depending on what frame of mind you are. But you somehow right. managed to hate on everybody. And I, I love that. I love a lot of people... You gotta have more hate in the world because hate's what makes the world go round. Because exactly. hate is a hell of a motivator, <laughs> and that's why I wanted to punch Vince Russo in the face. Exactly. And, and, I, and I, I admire your your spirit. I knew your history, so I figured it's a match made in heaven. <laughs> Brian Zane is Vince Russo. You're Jim spunky, Cornette. Brian. You're spunky. Me and Jim Ross one time uh, on on a WWF commentary. We Marlena, who was with Goldust, right. Terry Runnels. Boy, what a, he was a baby face at the time. Boy, what a spunky girl. She's full of spunk in Marlena, right? And Terry comes up and says, why did you guys say that? She wasn't from Oklahoma. She wasn't from down south. She didn't know that spunky had, had more than meaning. one meaning. You know? She wasn't so just X-rated. She wasn't just full of spunk in that way. She was also full of, you're full of spunk, Brian. You really are. Moxie is also a good word. Moxie is good. Um, you know, and uh, like, like we've talked about off camera, I've gotten a lot of comparisons to you over the years. People have said, like I said, that I am your illegitimate son and all this stuff, and you know that's all well and good. You know, but when I manage, I think that's where there's it comes. no support payments involved there, is there? No, it's fine. I'm I'm, I'm I'm past the minor years. You know, you don't have to support me. Very good. But you no, know, you know, I think so. I, but I try to make an effort to not to distance myself. From Visually, from the Jim Cornette look, I was wearing dress shirt and tie for a long time, but then I started wearing the sweatsuits. Um, but well, you know, we, we were joking about it earlier today. Is you're you wear glasses and you have brown hair and and you have kind of that impish grin, Jim Cornette. Well, that's the only person yeah. in the world that this description could One possibly match. fit. You One know? match. Yeah. But you know, when I see you know in the Indies, I see pictures on Facebook all the time of people who are just straight up ripping off your giving, and not in an ironic <laughs> way, like. 
their gimmick is loud suit, tennis racket, and they're not being ironic yeah. about it. They're not trying to parody you. They're just like, oh, I'm my own guy. Like, what do you feel, what is your reaction when you see that stuff? Are you, like, offended or flattered somewhere in the middle? Well, it, it depends on who's doing it, obviously. And also, and to be honest, I don't see a lot of that stuff because it's not like they're trying to point out to my attention, hey, look, I'm copying you, and I'm not actively searching out independent wrestling films to view anymore. But... <laughs> I don't really mind because it makes people think of me. Anytime a manager goes out with a, a loud suit or a tennis racket, even when it's not deserved, even when they're not, when they're going out with a tennis racket, they deserve what they get. Exactly. But if they go out with a loud suit or they happen to have that look on their face, oh, you're trying to be cornet, it just makes people think of me, which is fine with me. If they want to go out there, that's what I tell the guys in, in wrestling training seminars and classes and schools. If you want to go out and do somebody else's move, or, or, or somebody else's entrance, or somebody else's something, great, then that's just making that person more over and you being more forgettable. There, there was a guy that, uh, I won't mention any names, but he does the deal, he has an amazing vertical leap, and he does the deal where he goes down like Brock does and jumps flat-footed up to the apron of the ring. So that's an amazing athletic achievement. However, now everybody is in this whole arena is thinking about Brock Lesnar, the biggest star in wrestling, who's not on this show, and they're not thinking about you, they're thinking about, oh, look, he does the thing like Brock does. Mm -hmm. Do your own shit, That's right. what I always tell people. Um, moving on, speaking, we were talking about Vince Russo, stuff like that, obviously. Yeah, moving on away from that now. It's, it's why we're here, Vince Russo, but we know you hate them both. But if you had to work with one of them again, if you were forced to work with one again, Kevin Dunn or Vince Russo, who would you work with again? Oh, my God, that is uh, a conundrum wrapped in an enigma... Uh, but is there is there anything about either of them any in any part of the spectrum where you look at them? Okay, that quality makes you a redeeming human being. Is there anything like that about either of them? There's when when you talk about Dunn, then you got to talk. Well, there's or Russo, for example. He wants. Uh, you know, those are the two most miserable, disreputable motherfuckers that I've ever contemplated in my life. I couldn't warm up to either one of those guys if I was cremated with them. I cannot, for once, answer a question. I, it's like the, the gas chamber of the electric chair. Yeah. Would you rather have your balls nailed to a step stool or poked in the eye with a steel needle? I don't fucking know, folks. Pick it. Toss it up. So, aside from, you know, the, the, the legend, legendary tales of you having heat with people in the backstage scenarios, your Duns, your Russos, your Dixie Carters, and, you know, in today... We... Have you noticed, have you noticed there's a common thread amongst those people? Everybody's, Cornette's crazy, he's nuts, and, and, and some people in this room will testify to that. But the number of people actually in the wrestling industry, or that should be in the wrestling industry, or that come from the wrestling industry that I have a problem with is minute. If you notice, it's always people from outside the wrestling industry that shouldn't be involved in the wrestling industry and either have no respect for it or no talent for it. You're Kevin Dunn, you're Vince Russo, you're Dixie Carters. Also, they have a common thread. I wouldn't believe them if their tongue was notarized because they're liars. And if they lie to me or about me, that, that chaps my ass also. So those are the people I tend to have problems with. And it's not that I have a problem with everybody or even most people. It's just when I do have a problem, it's somehow so majestic, so so magnificent, such a, a world class problem. You never do you, you never do anything halfway. I don't do anything halfway. Well, no, I don't. So, but you have the, you know these purported issues, these confirmed issues with backstage people, and as of late, there's the few, you know your little feuds with Kevin Owens and the Young Bucks and Joey Ryan about stuff about stuff having to do with the business. Back when you were working full time at like WWF or WCW, was there any wrestler, not just a backstage person or an executive, was there any wrestler you had that level of heat with? Um, you know, not, not necessarily that level because you always have to, anybody that was in that position, one of the boys or one of the performers, one of the talent, you have to respect them that they are good enough to have gotten to that position. That, you know, so no, I've really never had that level of he, of course, Shawn Michaels, everybody knows, was a flaming, uncircumcised prick, a pill head, a moron. He liked to throw his weight around, liked to bully people, liked to fucking jack off a lot, liked to hold the television show hostage, liked to take his ball and go home whenever he didn't get his way. But he was also the best in-ring performer of the decade. So you can say, for example, that the guy's going to come in and bust the interview, or you can say, for example, that, yes, yeah, Shawn Michaels was a prick, and mistreated everybody and held the business hostage to his own selfish, immature, and childish whims 
him and his goddamn little fucking boys treehouse club that he had going, the click. Or you could also say that he was the most spectacular performer and he could tear the fucking house down in the ring. So I could respect him for that while meanwhile thinking, why does this fucking prepubescent adolescent prick, uh, you know, get fucking uh, uh, pandered to or catered to by Vince McMahon? But with the Russos and Duns and Dixie Carters, you can't find the, well, what should I respect about them? What have they done positive or good for the business? What talent do they possess that they can outperform or outdo something that somebody else can't? No, they don't. So that's the problem I have. I can respect the boys for at least being talented in some respect, even if they're flaming pricks otherwise. Speaking of heat and speaking of controversy, um, you know, uh, the question I would have is, what gets you more heat from people online, like Twitter and your podcast? And what gets you more heat? Your wrestling philosophies or your political and religious views? I don't know. It, it could be a toss-up. And, you know, it's like some of the people on Twitter also, to be honest, you know, when, when I say something like, you know, to the Young Bucks, because the Young Bucks, they super kicked a fucking eight-year-old kid. They're running spots with an eight-year-old because it was his birthday. You know, half the fans on Twitter think, oh, the Young Bucks are idiots and there's all this flippy acrobatic shit and we want to see wrestling. And then half the fans on Twitter are like, well, why shouldn't the Young Bucks wrestle the child, the, the young toe-headed boy, and make him happy it's his birthday and shouldn't the fans all have fun? So... <sighs> With, uh, you can't, it's like the Democrats and the Republicans. You can't reconcile those two schools of thought. And I understand that a lot of the younger people think that because they've never seen wrestling done right. It's been too long now. But at the same time, the fans on, on Twitter, they think that because I make these comments that I'm mad and I'm just, oh, and that's all I'm thinking about. I got more things to think about than fucking Young Bucks, right? It does chat my ass that they do this because the whole business suffers. That's why nobody's making any money in wrestling these days. Wrestling don't draw and nobody wants to see fucking wrestling. When wrestling does get publicity, it's always bad. Because, they, they, you know, when, if the Young Bucks want to be known as the guys that get beat up by eight-year-olds, the professional wrestlers that get beat up by eight-year-olds, that's fine. That's fine with me. But I <laughs> tweeted one time back. I said, well, if they want to get beat up by kids or whatever, they're not going to make any money. Somebody tweets, well, they just wrestled in the Budokan Hall in Tokyo last night. And I tweet back, just straight face, right? See, if they didn't do all that stupid shit, they wouldn't have to go all the way to Japan to find work. And oh my God, it blew up the people. It's an honor to wrestle in Japan, is it? <laughs> you, you people take Twitter way too fucking seriously. First time I saw you wasn't as a manager. I your time was doing the NWA invasion thing. It literally just ended. So you were doing commentary yeah. with like Jr. and like Shane McMahon on Saturday night. In fact, the, to, to this day, my favorite call of all time was when the Headbangers tore up uh, Tenta's uh, Cartman doll when he was uh, gold. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. My yeah. God, he wasn't fat or big boned. He was stuffed. Cartman <laughs> is down. To this day, well, that's the <laughs> down one. goes Cartman. Exactly. Down goes. So, but uh, the question I have. And, you know, you've done a lot of both. What was, would you consider more enjoyable to do, commentary or managing? Um, well, at the time I did them, what I was doing, I enjoyed managing first with the Midnight Express and then later on at Smoky Mountain because I really loved the guys that I was managing. It would be the Midnight Express or the Heavenly Bodies or whatever. I believed in them. Uh, we, you know, we were a great pairing. But just to manage anybody, like especially the no, it was a rib on me when I managed Mantar one time. It was a rib <laughs> on me. They told me like ten minutes before I'm going out. Bruce said, "You're going out with Mantar." Sure, I am. No, you really are. You know, and that didn't last long. But um, to announce with Jim Ross as my partner, because he taught me so much about announcing and color commentary and etc. And then I got to apply it here in OVW as the the uh, lead play -play. lead play by play guy on on the show for so long. I really, I would have rather been announcing then than managing because, you know, back in, in, at that time, uh, since the Midnight and the Heavenly Bodies were split up at that point, you didn't get to pick who you managed and I didn't know who they were going to stick me with and what stupid, silly gimmicks. So at least that way, if I was announcing, I could sit back a little bit. I was with JR. We were both quick enough that we hopefully wouldn't get any on us. And it was fun, so I, I enjoyed both at the time I was doing it. Right, it just depends on what area you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, exactly. Um, so and then later on, I enjoyed completely getting off camera and being back behind the camera. I enjoyed that a lot more because that way I didn't have to put on that hot suit. Yeah. Speaking of, you know, you talked about Mantar. Other than him, I would say, is there anyone you've ever managed where it just, like, didn't click? I mean, you've managed a lot of people, so statistically speaking, there has to be someone yeah. who just, <laughs> you didn't like. 
Well, it, it, and not necessarily that I didn't like, but you said it better, it didn't click. Right. Um, when I was just starting out, I managed Jesse Barr and, and uh, Art Barr's brother, Sandy right. Barr's son. And, and Jesse was a good amateur wrestler in his day and et cetera. And he was kind of green and starting out at the same time. And we were just, we tried to, to be matched, but we weren't matched to each other. I was much better off with Adrian Street and Miss Linda because mm -hmm. they were nothing like me personally, but on camera, it, it meshed a little better. Yeah, you know, there's there's been guys. Um, I don't really believe that I was the best manager the Moon Dogs ever had, but I brought them into Smoky Mountain Wrestling for a while because we needed a, a different team. But I didn't really fit the Moon Dog thing. That you know, Jimmy Hart had done that so well in Memphis before, so sometimes it just didn't click. But generally, I either liked most of the guys, or else I didn't have to spend that much time with them. Right. Um, so let's talk about your time as an executive of you know, Ring of Honor. One person that you worked with a lot, top, man, the man formerly known as Tyler Black, Seth Rollins. It's been a bit, yeah. of, a, been a bit, a bit of a good year for him, I would say. Oh, um, my God. Did now, you know, he's, he's the champion. He's on this huge push right now in WWE. Would you ever have anticipated him back when he was a Ring of Honor champion? Would you have ever seen all this coming? Well, y yes and no, I, and you can go back to things that I said at the time that I thought that Tyler Black was one of the most outstanding talents in the business. I thought that the, the match that he and Davey Richards had in Toronto for Ring of Honor was the 21st century equivalent of, of Flair and Steamboat. I never thought the WWE would switch their hiring practices and their booking practices and actually bring a guy like that in and put him on top. That's where I'm surprised. I'm not surprised. I always knew that Tyler Black could do it. Uh, that Seth Rollins could do it, I just didn't think he'd get a chance to do it. So I was wrong about that. And, and Courtney gets it wrong. Um, <laughs> exactly. Here's a question for you. Now, I think anyone who's, who knows me knows how much of an influence you are to me as a manager. So me being here with you, I'm, I'm man enough to admit this, I'm kind of marking out a little bit. I'm not going to be ashamed of saying that. But when it comes to you, Jim Cornette, which individual, living or dead, wrestling or otherwise, uh, would make you mark out? Uh, George Carlin. Um, I would be just shaking like a dog shitting peach seeds to get a chance to meet George Carlin. Unfortunately, that will not happen now since he is dead. Um, as far as in the business, I mean, you know, got all the people that I've learned from, uh, I'm a huge Jerry Lawler mark. I told him one time I may have made more money with his shit than he did. <laughs> Uh, you know, when you steal from one person, it's plagiarism. When you steal from many, it's research. Uh, I was all, you know, Mark had around Watts still to this day because he just, uh, you know, wrestling knowledge, not religiously or politically, but wrestling knowledge, Bill Watts is so far up above most everybody else that it's not even a contest. And, uh, you know, so it just, I would mark out for people whose work I admire. They may not be the biggest star or the most well-known or the biggest celebrity, but whoever I think is the absolute best at what they do, whatever that may be. And I've got, you know, different interests, I, you know, whether it be television or radio or movies or sports or whatever. Sports, not so much really the real stuff, but I always like the, the uh, predetermined sports, but it just depends. But yeah, I'd mark out for George Carlin. I always thought, just the way he used words and didn't give a shit. Because, see, that's why I, I'm, I'm to the point now where I, I said, I don't give a shit. I don't want to be in wrestling anyway. There is no more wrestling. So I don't give a shit what I say because I'm not lobbying for a job. That will set you free, my friend. Because when you don't have to suck up to anybody because you don't care to participate in their tea party, you can say whatever the fuck you want to. So when I say something good about somebody, people know I'm telling the truth because I have no ulterior motive. And when I say something bad about somebody, people know that's also how I legitimately feel because I'm not trying to take up for somebody else's fucking problem. So. Suppose Vincent Mann calls you up tomorrow and says, Jim, I want to bury the hatchet with you and put you in the Hall of Fame. I'm going to give you a, a network special, give you your own career retrospective DVD. How would you respond to that? I would say, Bolin, how can you sound so much like Vince? It's <laughs> No, you know, well, it, I mean, it's not going to happen because what could happen if, you know, I woke up tomorrow morning and Pamela Anderson was ringing my doorbell wanting to come and give me a blowjob every day. I can talk about what would happen then, too, because it's not going to happen. But, you know, it, I 
truthfully, I've answered the Hall of Fame question before a number of ways. I didn't do anything in the WWF that was Hall of Fame worthy. My Hall of Fame worthy stuff was with the Midnight Express. So neither, they, neither did Abdul the Butcher, though. So well, <laughs> and, and see, that's another thing. You know, I, I used to say I can't go in before Bruno San Martino, then they got fucking Brunos. Now I'm saying I can't go in before Luthez. It would be ridiculous. But, no, it, if I was to be put in with the Midnight Express, because as a performer, Hall of Fame, that's what it should be, Jim Cornette and the Midnight Express, then I wouldn't want them to lose out, so I would probably say yes, but then there's that little thing where they have you sign a Legends contract, and for five grand I'm gonna sign a contract and let them tell me, oh, well, we want you to go here, we want you to do that, because I don't like that, I like to now pick my own spots. I'm not really losing any sleep about it. It's not a fucking legitimate Hall of Fame. I know they do a great ceremony, but at the same time, it's who Vince likes, and is it a quota, okay, we got the, we got the woman, we got the minority, we got the dead person, we got the main event, and who else has been sucking up around here for 20 years and we'll put them in regardless, and a celebrity. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't care. And people, they don't believe I don't care. Because everybody else apparently cares. I don't fucking care. I'm sorry, but hook me up to a lie detector. I don't fucking care. It's a nice production, but you know, it's not a legitimate wrestling hall of fame. I'm already in. Wrestling Observer Hall of Fame, the NWA Hall of Fame, the Pro Wrestling Hall of Fame in Amsterdam, all those other Halls of Fame, and they have varying degrees of legitimacy, but at least more than one person decides who right. goes in. And that was the mostly complete Jim Cornette interview. I apologize so much for the technical difficulties. I hope you can forgive me about all that. There was actually one more question I asked him, uh, but my video runs out halfway through its response. So I just didn't want to include that last question for you know have, not having to deal with a cliffhanger ending there. Uh, even though I kind of did put a cliffhanger in there by not including it. So kind of a paradox. But again, I hope you forgive me for the technical difficulties. Uh, I hope you enjoyed what you saw of the interview. Me personally, I was honored just to sit with him and ask him those questions and to shoot the breeze with him off camera. I was honored to work with him uh, in the Vince Russo sketch. Uh, it was just a great experience. I can't thank him enough. If you want to see more of Jim Cornette, go to his website, jimcornette.com, or go to mlwraider.com to see his podcast, The Jim Cornette Experience, and Corny's drive Through. Once again, I want to thank Danny Davis and the staff at Ohio Valley Wrestling in Louisville, Kentucky for allowing me to use their facilities both for the Russo sketch and for the Cornet interview. Thank you guys so much for allowing me to do that. I really appreciate it. I also want to thank Sweatsito. They're the company that make my custom sweatsuits. This red one here I wore for the very first time in that interview with Jim Cornette, so it's very sentimental, very near and dear to my heart. You see me wear these every episode. Uh, I think they're awesome. Check them out at sweatsito.com for all your custom sweatsuit needs. Be sure to thumbs up this video Video, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret and buy the t-shirt. I'm Brian Zane and I'll see you next time.